Hi, it's Dina. I'm back and I have got a fun guest for you to meet today. It's a pretty cool guy. He's lived a very wild and crazy life and he's the first one that'll tell you about it. And he's going to share some of that today. His work now as a recovery coach is a testament to the lessons that he learned the hard way. And he tries to share that with us so that we can understand and have some compassion, I feel like, as well, towards people who are living that lifestyle. Now, it might be somebody that will come to mind for you listening that you know, or somebody you uh, have actually been yourself. And just to have some hope and encouragement that you can come through that and you can do good with your life, do good with those lessons you can impact and help others' lives with what you've learned. So never give up. And I think that is such a great message that comes out of this conversation. Now, one quote that he mentions that I really liked, and I'll probably get it wrong, but you'll get the idea. He says, you will find your rock bottom or you'll hit your rock bottom when you stop digging. And I think that is so true. Like, stop digging already. And yeah, so we're going to get real here. If you've got littles uh, in the background, you might want to throw in your earbuds because we're going to be dropping some bombs. But I think it's so real, so authentic and so genuine. And I'm happy to know that there are people out in the world like Zen who are supporting men, supporting others, helping them to get their lives sorted out. And, you know, they you spiral down and you feel stuck, but there's hope. Now, our spring issues of Divorce Magazine and Life Changes Magazine are now available digitally online, super easy to find. They're hyperlinked. There's embedded video, lots of resources there, some really great uh, team members that we have for you to meet that can help answer questions for you around so many of the issues that you face when you're going through life changes or divorce especially right so make sure and check those out all the links are in our show notes as well every two weeks are online support groups so those are they're online so they're accessible they're free you can join from anywhere check the link in the show notes for the events and you can pick one that fits your schedule pick one that you feel uh, the, those that are topic specific with a keynote speaker, that it's something you're looking for information around. Check out our website too, like dig in, go through it. There is a lot of gold there that will probably help you find the answers to some of your questions, or you'll find a resource and you can contact them and many offer free consults as well. So don't be afraid to contact them. That's what they're there for. They want to hear from you. We care. We want to help. And I'm here to connect you with those people. You don't have to stay stuck. You don't have to just be embarrassed or ashamed of, you know, the fact your life didn't go really how you expected. Don't stay stuck. Don't give up. We're here to help you. And at the very least, you're going to know that you are not alone. Okay, let's meet Zan. Welcome to the show, Zan. I really enjoyed our first conversation when we were connected by a fellow friend. And I was so intrigued by the journey that you've been on and mm -hmm. the darkness that you've experienced and what you've taken from that and created for your life and your work now. And there's a lot, there's a lot to your story. So everybody listening, if you enjoy our conversation, expect to hear more from Zan. He's going to be back. He's going to tell us more. And I think I want to start first Please to have you introduce yourself mm -hmm. and let's, let's dig in a bit to the relationship part, because this is, this is what my audience is coming to primarily mm -hmm. is to hear about divorce, relationship, that type of thing, and how that can be affected by other things in our lives. So mm -hmm. if you want to start with those types of uh, experiences that you have, have been through and then we're going to dig deeper into some of those. Sure. Um, yeah, I can talk divorce. I have a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, yes, I do. Um, yeah, thank you for having me on again, Dina. It's really nice to see you again. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed our chat last time too. And uh, shout out to our mutual friend, Anne McCaska, for uh, introducing us. Um, 
Yeah, uh, we could talk about relationships. Sure, I am. Um, uh, an important part of my story is that I'm from a really small town in the East Kootenays. Um, shout out to Sparrow, BC. Um, it's a town of probably 4,000 people. But that was, um, I was there till I was around 18 or 19 years old. So that was really uh, defined the first chapter, I guess you can say, of my life. And, um, you know, uh, and talking about relationships, yeah, I mean, there was, it was the classic uh, high school relationships then. Um, you know, high school sweethearts, that sort of stuff. And uh, I did move to Vancouver after that. And I kind of consider when I left uh, that small town, that chapter somewhat closed. Uh, it was like a different, like, you know, in your life, when you look back, it's like, okay, that was a defining moment for that chapter. I, I loved growing up in Sparwood. I have nothing but good memories there. And it was great, but I wanted more. I ended up in Vancouver with a friend of mine and I uh, spent a few years here and I ended up in London, England after that uh, for probably, I was supposed to be there for two years and I ended up five um, be, for reasons I'll get into uh, shortly. But I mean, London was defined by partying. And uh, whereas I had grown up in this small town, um, you know, you're in a, there was, Gosh, I think there was 70 people in my grad class, maybe 300 in the entire high school. But so um, about relationships, when I got out to London, England, I was all of a sudden exposed to um, lots of women from all over the world. And as a young man, that was um, an exciting time, we'll say. Uh, I had a lot of good friends. We went out a lot. Um, drinking and drug use is a huge part of my story which we'll get into that as well but there was an awful lot of that going on um the reason i was there five years was because i did meet a uh a young girl there uh we did get married and my son was born there uh so it ended up being five years there in london we came back to canada and i know we're going to be talking about divorce a lot uh this was my first wife and my young son um she never really settled into Canadian life and about he was four years old and we separated we got divorced um well, well we could get into that one later the details of that one if you like but as a summary um a, a large factor throughout that is I went we went through a custody battle that was uh devastating to me it was expensive um I was drinking heavily at the time as well. And she the custody was because she wanted to take him back to England. Um, and I fought with everything I had to prevent that. He's our, my only my only son. Um, through, uh, you know, I'll be perfectly honest in this podcast too, like I always am. Um, a promiscuity is a large part of my story. So after that, uh, my marriage fell apart. I was immediately online dating right away. This was the early days of online dating. I don't even think Tinder was out yet, but it was the, the early days. I just threw myself into dating. Through that dating cycle, I met another girl and we got married. So now this was my second marriage. Um, and that one, which we can get into the details of that too, but to make a very long story short, that one lasted about five years and uh, was uh, very heavily, we were under a heavy cloud of alcoholism and, and drug abuse during this time. Um, she ended up leaving uh, because of that, or largely because of that. Um, we, we were out of control. I was the driver of it. And um, I think she took one look at her life and where it was heading and said, I need to get out of here. But this one, this one actually devastated me. I had never been truly heartbroken like this before. I had never experienced that deep, deep pain that um, some of your listeners have maybe experienced. Um, and it really destroyed me. I went off the deep end with, you know, prescription drugs, um, what would be called hard drugs. I had a, you know, I had a pretty, I wouldn't call it a cocaine addiction, but I really loved cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> and as well as always drinking through the whole thing, heavily binge drinking. And again, because I seem to have this inability to be alone in this world, as soon as that marriage broke up and heartbroken, here I am online dating again, right into this cycle of um, putting myself out there and just living that life. 
Uh, this lasted about eight months and I really fell off the deep end. I hit a big rock bottom. Uh, we could talk about that later too. Um, but I found recovery after that. Um, I believe it was a necessity. I often say this, I don't believe I would be around to have this conversation if this didn't happen. Um, especially now with uh, the horrors of fentanyl and how, you know, it's into, it's not just on the downtown east side of Vancouver or in certain neighborhoods, it's everywhere and ubiquitous across drugs, right? Ecstasy, cocaine, whatever. A lot of the things that I liked. Um, so I, I, if I hadn't found recovery, I was heading down a really, really dark path, basically. And when I was talking earlier about chapters closing, that's uh, that chapter closed on December, uh, December 1st, 2014. And so now it's been over nine years in recovery, but with with that comes a lot of growth and a lot of emotions and a lot of struggles in recovery. Just because you stop drinking doesn't mean life gets easier. You, you can deal with it in a better, more productive way, but uh, that's when you really dig into yourself and start examining why am I the way I am? Um, why do I constantly want to fill this hole that's in me um with with love or what i perceive as love or like women like what is that and why is that happening and why do i drink why am i driven to drink uncontrollably and wreck the relationships that i'm in self-destruct right so that brings us to today that's a that's a summary i hope that was okay for you i yeah i need to unpack this just like i did when we first talked first i want to say how much I admire and respect someone who can go through that and not only pick themselves up from their rock bottom, mm -hmm. but share it with others, do something that is going to help others mm -hmm. and use that journey and hopefully inspire other men out there who are feeling alone mm -hmm. or or the women in their wives or the children in their wives or their parents, family, anybody that's, that cares about them mm -hmm. to get a bit of a window into why, and you know, like what is, what is going on? They're caught mm -hmm. in this cycle or they seem like they're out of it and then they drop right back into it. And, mm -hmm. and maybe even in a worse way than the first time. So it, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's really powerful when it comes from somebody who has lived it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I choose to recover out loud, it's called. It's, you know, I I have a lot of shame in my life over certain things, but um, I don't feel shame about uh, my alcoholism or everything that I went through. There's some guilt, you know, shame and guilt are different. Uh, there's some guilt, certainly, about uh, some parenting or some, you know, past relationships. But um, recovering out loud means just sharing my story, right? Um, you're right, if it can inspire somebody, because as that summary pretty much told you, like, I'm, I'm just a normal dude. Um, and often in life, whether it's, you know, anything we want, whether it's recovery or freedom from addiction or just a better relationship, whatever it is, we look to other people and we can say, I want what that person has, but they must have something that I don't. And, you know, that's not true. You know, we, uh, we look to other people. Yeah. The, they have something we don't, but they're not. We're just people that started something and then saw it through, continued on through the hard times, right? Because the reason to not drink was so much bigger than the reason for me to keep drinking. Right. So that was, um, that was, and I will say too, Dina, you know, my, my rock bottom, um, it's a, it's a longer story, but I found myself, I, I was a binge drinker. So I started blacking out all the time and not remembering anything, not knowing how I got home. Um, finding myself in bad parts of town in the middle of the night, um, all these sorts of things, which is not the best place to be as a 38 year old father, um, you know, or a member of society, really. And uh, that was, I had one very, very bad weekend, which is probably too long of a story than what we have here, but a very bad weekend where it just kicked my ass so bad. I was so ashamed of just what I had become at that time. And that was my rock bottom. Um, but rock bottom, when we think about that, people often think, you know, I need to, I need to, I, I've still got my house, I've still got my job, I must not be an alcoholic. Um, 
but rock bottom is can be whatever you want it to be. Rock bottom is when you, whenever you decide to stop digging that fucking hole that you've been digging for yourself. You don't have to lose everything. You don't have to lose your wives like I did. Yeah. Um, you don't have to fall so far that you lose your job or anything like that. It's, uh, it's whenever you decide to make that change. Yes, or your children. Um, that is such a good point. And, and I love that picture that you draw of mm -hmm. we are holding the shovel. We're doing the digging. Mm -hmm. We're not going to wait for some epiphany. I guess this is my rock bottom. Yeah. Because there is very high functioning people with serious addictions that are just on that verge of, of losing everything or losing some very significant parts of their lives. Absolutely. And the shovel analogy you mentioned is great because, you know, I woke up on that Sunday morning or it was Monday morning, actually, because I had been blackout drunk the night before um, Monday morning. And that's with the shovel analogy. I was like, I dug this fucking hole like I did this to myself. There's only one person that can get me out of here. Nobody is coming to save me. Nobody is coming to um, make this all go away. The fact that I now have two divorces and um, what amounts to a significant alcohol problem, um, all, si all fingers pointed at me. And it was the first time that I really took responsibility and ownership of that, of just like, holy, like, I, I did this. Now I need to get myself out of this, right? Nobody else is going to. Um, no, no woman that I met... Nobody is going to, um, because even you think about people say, oh, you know, do it for your kids or do it for your job. Or or sometimes a, a wife will give an ultimatum like I'm, or, or a husband will give an ultimatum like if, if you don't stop, I'm going to leave or whatever it is. But if the person has to come to that realization themselves, I believe this, it can be argued, of course, but um, you have to get that acceptance of what you've done and then what you're going to do about it, right? And that's so difficult for certain people to take ownership because with alcoholism, we blame. Um, oh, it's not my fault my dad was an alcoholic. It's not my fault that that she left, my my second wife left. It was, she, you know, I could make up all sorts of things, but really it was me. And that's a tough pill to swallow for people. It's bitter and it's not easy. But when you can accept that, and take accountability is what it is. It's accountability for your life. You take accountability for the good things in your life and the bad things. You, you know, you, when we talked last time, we talked about, you know, the cornerstone of my coaching company is, is uh, you are the captain of your ship. You are at the wheel. You are in charge of this journey of your life. Whatever direction you go, whether you fight the waves when they come or the storms or whether you let them just blow you around wherever, ultimately, every good decision you've made and every bad decision you've made is all you made it you're the captain so how are you going to steer this ship going forward right and that can be somewhat of a game changer when you think of it like that we're going to get right back to our conversation with sam he's got even more that he is going to share with us about his life and what he's doing now from the lessons that he's learned now i'm excited to share with you about a company that is offering very affordable, very um, relevant and accessible, legit legal services and identity protection and recovery. Legal Shield and ID Shield. Now they've been around for over 50 years. They're helping over 4 million people already with legal access. And what this is now, it's even easier with an app, as a member, if you have a question about any type of legal from your will, creating your will, if you've got documents you want reviewed, um, something to do with real estate, with family law, with, um, with vehicles, with insurance, with whatever it might be, even as a, as a customer, if you've got questions about something and you need some help from a lawyer, you will be connected with a vetted lawyer who knows the laws in your area and can help you even as far as making a phone call or writing a letter on your behalf. All of that's included in this subscription and it's month by month and you will have just by tapping the button you can 
send a request to be connected and you go through the process very easily, very quickly. And you can also sign up for their ID shield. So what that is, is identity protection and restoration. You let them know what you would like monitored. You will be notified if there's anything that is suspicious and then they will, if there has been a breach in your um, identity, as far as your identity theft, even reputation, even your reputation on social media, they will then assign your own licensed private investigator to resolve your issue it takes as, for as long as it takes to make sure to restore that and your identity to pre-theft status and even cover up to $3 million of identity theft related losses. Now, why wouldn't you want to have that coverage? This is phenomenal. If you are interested to learn more about the details of this, please click on the link in the show notes and you will find out more about Legal Shield and ID Shield. Now let's get back to our conversation with Zan. Well, and again, I want to bring this back to the people that surround you. Whether you're like, if you're someone that has someone you're concerned about that you wish you could help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe an ultimatum, maybe a, something like that will be a bit of a wake up call and, you know, mm -hmm. bring attention. Mm -hmm. But it's not up to you. It's not a failure of yourself either. If you aren't the one to create that change, you might bring it to attention, but it's really up to that person mm -hmm. and they have to be in the right place. Now this even relates, and this is totally, uh, you know, another tangent, mm -hmm. but it brings to mind the frustration people feel trying to help someone get out of an abusive situation. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, there's some parallels there they are bonded in a, in, in an a unhealthy way to yeah. their abuser, just like you were bond. Yeah. You like, you know, you had your addictions and things that you were bonded to. And so, mm -hmm. um, they keep, they go back mm -hmm. and, and that's familiar. And that is, yeah. um, from the outside. So frustrating. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You probably know this better than most people, right? Yeah, unfortunately, but <laughs> I, you mentioned the coaching. So what you have taken, we can go back in and, and I want to hear a little bit more around the parenting um, and some of the relationship mm -hmm. breakdowns that you experienced and, and, you know, how the addictions contributed to that. But I, I want to jump in here as well right now, because you mentioned the coaching mm -hmm. and how you're using your journey to help others. Mm -hmm. So Tell us more about what you've developed from the life lessons you've had. Sure. Um, so uh, an important part of this is um, I was uh, gainfully employed for a long time. Um, I worked for over 15 years for an engineering company here in uh, Vancouver. Um, and through all of my heavy alcoholism, I kept this job. I, you know, I didn't, I never lost my job because of uh, drinking or drug use, Um because mainly because I was a binge drinker. So I would party from Friday after work till Sunday night, show up to work hungover Monday, Tuesday, and then kind of ride it out until Friday when I could start again. So um, I found recovery in 2014. And shortly after COVID, um, I get confused with the years because uh, that whole COVID time is a, yeah, it's a blur. But, um, <laughs> it was shortly after COVID. I, I you know, the world was uh it was such a weird time um there was so much questioning and chaos and everybody was on edge and i really looked around this was i'd been at my job for about 15 years and made really good money it was a it was a good solid blue collar career um i planned on retiring there but i just looked around and i just said you know what i'm deeply unhappy um and that's not a fault against the company it was just the work i was doing and i wasn't fulfilled at all and um you know, because I had a good salary, there was all this safety. It was it made perfect sense to stay there because it was safe, good money, retirement, all this sort of stuff, right? Um, but I was so deeply unfulfilled. And by now I had been probably five to six years in recovery at this point. And I just love it. I love talking to people about recovery. I love um, 
I love seeing people's lives change uh, because I know that it's possible for anybody. This is one of the things I always say. Recovery is 100% possible, possible for anybody who wants it. And I had a girlfriend at the time, a really sweet girl, um, one of my, you know, as I said, relationship to relationship. Um, but she was, we, I was saying how unhappy I was. I used to talk about this all the time. You know, I'm unhappy in this job. Um, and the one time I had told her my, my recovery story of just how it all happened and all this, and she was just, it, it's a long story. And she just said after, she's like, why don't you do this for a living? Like, where can you use recovery? And it hadn't even occurred to me before. I was like, yeah, how can I do this? Um, so I thought, well, you know, you could, I've sponsored people through AA. Full disclosure, I don't go to AA anymore. But um, back in the day, I do credit it with a large part of my early recovery. So if you do have a severe drinking problem, what you believe to be, or substance abuse, I do. First thing I always say to everybody is go check out a meeting. You might find exactly what you're looking for there. Um, but I'd been a sponsor, I enjoyed that. And so I looked around and recovery coaching came up. Now it's not really a thing yet. I hope that it grows more. Um, but what it is, is coaching is different than counseling, as you probably know. Um, I initially went to school. I, I left this job. That, that's So I was like, you know what? I want to dedicate myself to recovery. Big, huge risk stepping out into the unknown, um, leaving safety, security, everything behind into literally not making any money for a long time. Um, and I went to do counseling and the first six months of the counseling program was about coaching. So, and I kind of realized at the end of that, I'm like, this is what I actually like. Um, I always sum it up briefly with counseling is um, what happened and coaching is okay, so what are you going to do about it? So that's a very, very rudimentary explanation that I give. And I love counseling. I've been to therapy, big fan of therapy, big fan of any kind of healing profession, talking, et cetera. But I really found uh, coaching was really spoke to me. And so I left the counseling program and just started trying to wing it as a recovery coach. I got a diploma in coaching and just kind of started using recovery as as my the foundation of it. It has grown, as you know, we've talked about this, it's grown into more of um, recovery, but also slash um, men's coaching. Yeah. Usually, usually for, uh, I would say, middle-aged men struggling, doesn't have to be with alcoholism, although that's a large part of it, but it could be divorce, could be unfulfillment, could be any kind of addiction, pornography, sex, gambling, um that sort of stuff so that's kind of where i am now i'm also a group facilitator so i run a recovery uh program out of a treatment center here locally which is very fulfilling so i left a high paying job uh where i was miserable for uh a lower um compensation but where i'm actually super happy and fulfilled which is to me makes perfect sense to some it might not but to me it makes perfect sense to me, I believe, Zan, that the value you are bringing to people's lives that you are connected with, that value, there's no way to put a dollar tag on that. Like you can't mm -hmm. ever know who you have touched. You've been on other podcasts, you've done coaching, you've, you don't know who has mm -hmm. heard something or just mm -hmm. gone, oh my God, like Mm -hmm. okay, I can do that. He did it. I can do it. Yeah. Or even recognizing where they are. Like mm -hmm. you say, they, they could be high functioning. Like you were very, you were successful in your job. You had things that from the outside, many people probably thought you had it together and mm -hmm. you know, absolutely. Like you said, it hadn't affected some of the things in your life. So it's easy no. to fool ourselves into, you know, whatever they're using it for. It's the coping mechanism. It's avoidance. It's, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that crutch is there for, mm -hmm. it's still, it's comfortable. It's something, <laughs> even though that makes them feel like shit, it's like, it's comfortable. Right. Oh yeah. And, How many people wake up on a, with a brutal hangover and be like, Oh, never again. I need to, I need <laughs> yeah. to change. I need to do this. And then as soon as the hangover is gone, it's like, when am I doing that again? That's the cycle I was on for many years. I fully understand it. And um, 
as you know like i come honestly honestly with people like I, people can relate because i've been where they've been and um it's very fulfilling i mean the, the hard part is explaining to people what what coaching actually is recovery coaching what it is um the, but I'll, I'll say this i talk to anybody the people reach out to me all the time i'll talk to anybody and, and tell them that recovery is possible for them coaching is if they want to go on a coaching journey with me obviously there's an investment with that but that's a very focused um very specific on on them we kind of there's lots of different ways value learning about uh, you know all kinds of things but um i'll talk to anybody about recovery anytime my phone's up people message me all the time i'm happy to what i'm encouraged by is this recovering out loud and how it gives permission to other people men specifically because it's it, society sets them on a pedestal of you aren't allowed to fail you have to take care you have to be strong like no crying no no mistakes mm -hmm. like and if you do you're just crucified for it and when you as a man recover out loud and share what you're saying it gives them permission to to, to just step back and think about do i need help do i need to talk to somebody like zan um or somebody else that i trust mm -hmm. do i even have that problem and mm -hmm. bring that awareness which will be the catalyst to seek that change and go through that hard work. Cause it's hard work. I'm, I, I haven't had to struggle with those things, but it's hard work from what I've heard to once you make that choice. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's, you really have to start examining yourself and um, yeah. the, why you are the way you are, how you got in this mess. Um, but you're right. Uh, what you're saying, the reason I work with, with men mainly, um, and generally of a certain age, I mean, I've had all ages, um, contact me, but I generally work with guys around my age that have been through a lot of the same things. I'm 47. Um, I feel that men are hugely underrepresented, um, unheard in a lot of ways and in, in the mental health uh, world, you know, um, and this is a huge generalization, generalization, I know, but um, women generally have a group of friends, they're much more open to talk, they're, they're people that will listen to them and hear them. Men don't, and again, it's a generalization, I have to throw that out there before yeah. any emails come in of just like, well, so and so is not. <laughs> no. Men are very unlikely to share their true feelings or emotions or their fears. Um, even with their best friends, you go out, you watch UFC, you have some beers, you'll have a great conversation and a ton of laughs. I know this, but are you really talking about like your 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 fears about your relationship or that your wife might leave you or that you think you're drinking too much or that, you know, maybe your your kid hates you or whatever it is, right? So there's um, what I have found is when you get another guy into a safe and non-judgmental uh, confidential space and allow them to talk um, they feel heard and oftentimes for the what I would susp suspect is for the first time in a very very long time if ever um, the facilitation program that I run for a treatment center here uh, it's a five-week program and I get all it's men and women um, but over the past year I've had uh, multiple guys come in and that I would describe as as tough guys alpha males uh, some with like head tattoos. Um, I've had uh, cage fighters, um, all kinds of guys that come in hard nosed, resistant to the program. They don't want to be there. They unwilling to share. But it doesn't take long when you give them the space where all of a sudden they're sharing things that they've never said before. And this happens obviously in private coaching too, more so. Um, I've had guys share things from their childhood or what, what even recent stuff that they just have no one to share it with. That's the pathway to healing is sharing things, right? Being heard, being validated. Um, and it's, I be don't believe that men are validated enough with their feelings. You actually touched on it with the, you know, uh, like don't cry, you know, toughen up. Men don't talk about their feelings. And, you know, I'm a, big tattooed guy I'm a blue collar worker too I understand that but for and I also know that when I started sharing vulnerably um 
everything changed and that started in recovery but it's everything changed i'd never shared my feelings out loud before i'd never said i was an alcoholic before that broke down barriers and smashed the stigma stigmas that made it okay and uh a lot of the guys that i work with privately they will they will cry and they haven't cried in years and years and years and you know what like i have no problem saying this crying feels good if you are hurt or upset or something has wounded you in some way oh man you let it out with tears that that's a that you feel so good tears release the stress hormones right like you feel better afterwards and from that you can be like okay now i can rebuild there's not it's not unmanly uh, to feel emotions, right? And that's what I try to say to people. Not that not that everything I do is a big cry fest or anything like that, but there are, men are hurt, men are wounded. Um, I, I've shared this before on, on other podcasts, but there was the quote that hit me so hard. I was out for a run and I was listening to a podcast with a guy named Jason Wilson, who's a men's advocate. And he said, um, Inside every inside every man is a broken boy that needs to be healed. Mm. And I remember this all the time because I stopped running and I was like, that's me. Like I'm a like I said, I'm a big muscular man, but I've got a broken boy inside of me too. And you know what? Every man does. Whether they will say it to you or not, whether they will show you it, you know, people can be married for 20, 30 years and They'll never share their hurts the way that they were, the shame that they have from a child, the things that their negative self-worth, their lack of self-love, all these sorts of things, right? So when you, to sum it up, when you give them that platform in a place where they're not going to be judged and is confidential and they know that and believe that, it's like, there it comes. And it's a, it's an honor for me to create that space where um, guys can feel comfortable with that because it's, uh, it helps me too. Right. Like sharing. Sometimes I, I'll have a session and uh, obviously it's fully confidential, but I'll see my partner later on and she'll be like, you're on a high. And I'm just like, I know, because this guy just had this breakthrough and he changed in front of me. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and I wish, like I said, I wish more men would reach out. I know it's difficult. I didn't until I was in my 40s. I know it's <laughs> difficult. But wow, if I could tell any guys out there listening, it's uh, an absolute game changer when you can start fixing yourself. That's all it is. That's what recovery means to get back. So whether it's alcohol addiction or anything, it's just to get back, to get your life back, right? Fix yourself. You got to do that. What did you find mm -hmm. during, you know, the tougher times was the the hardest things that came up in your relationships as far as your parenting and your marriages, like how I'm trying to imagine, you know, how, how did you have the, the binge drinking and still to try and maintain relationships with people? You said your work wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. impacted by that. It may have been, but it, it didn't, it didn't mean a loss of job, but obviously yeah. you, the, the relationships, there were losses. Um, how did you navigate through that? <laughs> With a lot of chaos. Um, I brought chaos. I was attracted to chaos. Uh -huh. um, I was a I was a broken person, and broken people are oftentimes attracted to other broken people. Um, because somebody with a strong sense of self-worth or or um something like that is is scary at the time. So and that doesn't mean I only dated broken women no. <laughs> um, but um you know the the womanizing is a huge part of my life and it always has been from that small town till uh you know recent years let's say and um it's always been up there but i was always just a uh a drinker i was never an angry drinker this is a part of it i was never angry i was never I don't think I was mean. Some people out there might say that there may have been meanness, but I was just generally a really fun guy. So I, and I love the company of women. So I pursued that. I chose to pursue that. Um, and, you know, every, every once in a while, one, I would marry one <laughs> and then, and then deal with that. Again, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I married and was attracted to girls that would, and women that would, um, I don't want to say enable me, that's the wrong word, but that, 
wanted the lifestyle that I gave them because I wasn't going to change for anybody. It was, if I met you, this is who I am. I party all the time. And if you want to join me on this ride, that's awesome. And, and you know, a, a lot of them did. So I was attracted to, I mean, I always joke, both of my ex-wives, they're both covered head to toe in tattoos. They're both rocker chicks. Like they're just, um, I had a type. We can say that, which is really funny because my, my girlfriend and the love of my life now is the farthest thing from that type. But um, it was chaotic to answer your question. Um, I caused drama um, because you, when you're, you're a broken person inside, you're going to bring that out, right? Like whether it's through, I don't know, jealousy or wounds from childhood that come out in these sorts of, in relationships, uh, unhealed wounds, I mean. Um, and like I said, if I found myself single, I would just throw myself right out there, like right on Tinder, serial dating, you know, multiple dates a week, juggling on my phone, like just every, all the time, right? And, and but it sounds awesome. And when I tell people, you know, or, or tell like guys or whatever, that there's a long history of, of women or whatever, they're like, oh my God, that's awesome. And I'm like, well, in some ways, maybe, but also it's kind of sad <laughs> in a lot of ways too, because you're really looking to fill a hole of, um, you know, something from childhood usually, right? Like I'm, as I said, I'm unable to be alone. So I'm, as soon as I would find myself alone, it's right back in, like, I got to be going out, got to be going on dates, got to be doing all this sort of stuff. And that's, it wasn't until recovery that I had a chance to really get to examine myself and why I was the way I was, right? And if we do another podcast, it's probably a bit too long to get into now, but a game changer for me was learning about attachment styles. Yeah. That changed everything for me, but I, I I have a lot. I can talk a lot about that. So if you want to save that for another, yeah, one, but... I think that would be good. What I find interesting, Zan, is that you had um, marriages, relationships with people that knew what they were getting into. They were on the same page, mm -hmm. and others went, "Whoa, they're just living the rock star life," mm -hmm. but that still didn't work out in the mm -hmm. end. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the first marriage of mine was, you know, the 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 divorce or separation was actually easy. We just looked at each other one day and just said, like, I don't think I love you anymore. And she was like, Yeah, I don't think so either. I mean, of course, we had a young child. Right. Um, he was four, I believe, and I don't mind saying this at all. But one of the things is, um, you know, we we're married, but our you have a young child, things are happening, etc. But our sex life went away and became non-existent and I've, I've often thought you know once that happens there's a huge crack in the relationship right so but when, when I look back now and now that I've done therapy one of the things I went deep into in therapy is values work figuring out my values and how those drove me in life and I look back now and I see our values were completely different oh. um, we had we had one thing in common is that we loved to party um, all night long, you know, when I met her in London, we would stay up for days at a time. We would be out all the time, very social, active people. Um, but our values were completely different. And once we got back to Canada and the, that type of partying that we did in London was somewhat over, we just kind of looked at each other. We're like, we have nothing in common, like besides this one thing yeah. that was keeping us together. Um, so that one was an easy separation. The divorce was hard because there was a child that was being tugged now between staying in Canada and going back to London, England. Um, and that was a real battle that that built incredible resilience in me because um, I was fearful. I was uh, I, I didn't want to lose him at all. And I was willing to spend any money, um, go to any length to keep him here. But you never know what a judge is going to decide. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that would have been heartbreaking for me. Uh, that was the, you know, and our, our custody battle wasn't pretty at all. We were very, very nasty to each other. Um, all the while, obviously trying to shield him from it. But I, when I look at some of his issues now, and he's 19 years old now, I think of like that, it had to have affected him negatively at four years old. Um, parents that won't speak to each other that are shouting on the phone constantly. Um, so the divorce and the custody was very hard in that one. The second marriage, as I said, she left largely, and there were warning signs. I, I was listening to a podcast the other day that say like, by the time the person leaves the marriage, there's been like two years of warning signs that are not being paid attention to. Another generalization, it's usually the men that aren't seeing it. 
uh, but the wife or whatever will leave many hints along the way that she's unhappy or whatever. But when you're, we would have issues and not solve them and then just go drink and everything would be great. Mm -hmm. And we party and everything would be great. None of the issues ever got resolved. And then they would explode later on because it's like, a, it's like holding a volleyball underwater. Like you can hold it there as long <laughs> as you want, but when you let it go, it's going to explode. So um, I didn't see the signs and by all accounts, I thought she was happy. Um, but we were in a very bad place uh, with our, our alcoholism, especially. And uh, so I think she saw the writing on the wall and left. I tried, I've shared this before, I tried so hard to get her back. I tried every trick in my arsenal, everything that I could do, like to the point of begging and pathetic um, things like long winded nonsensical emails um written um days of no sleep or when i was drunk or whatever and just i tried everything and uh she would not come back but that's that was a devastating one of course when you look back now everything seemed to happen the exact way that it was supposed to happen um that's often the case uh that incredible heartbreak that i went through uh, led to me. I always said, from my first marriage, I got my son. From my second marriage, I got recovery. So, and now I'm in a, just so your listeners know that, think that I'm not out womanizing and stuff like that constantly, I'm in a very, very healthy long term relationship. So, there's hope <laughs> for there's anybody out hope. there. Yes. Always hope for everything. And I like that you touched on the mental health issues that men they are unique to men in some ways because of how our culture doesn't allow that space for, mm -hmm. you know, just to let their true feelings come out, that they feel safe, they won't be judged, criticized. Mm -hmm. And too often I feel they, they, they give up and mm -hmm. well, there's warning at... signs or nobody will have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Are you okay? And that can be a game changer. Men are lonely. Even in relationships, they're lonely. Um, I'm glad that you you uh, agree with that as well. And I mean, you could just look at the statistics mm -hmm. about uh, suicide rates, homelessness. Um, the large majority of it is is men, right? Um, not to say, you know, the problems are everywhere, of course, but there's i just don't believe there's that outlet or if there is um men are afraid to take it because of fear, fear i mean fear is a driver of of almost all of our behavior when you think about it um and there's a lot of fear about reaching out i, I know it because i didn't want to do it either i suffered for years because i would, didn't want to reach out for fear of appearing weak or out, not in control of my life or all of these things and um, I know that guys are suffering out there too. Um, well, and it's then really they... common. And I encourage people to think about their brothers, their partners, Ooh, you know, yeah. their dad. Like, who's lonely out there? Who's struggling silently? You know, like there's that term, uh, there's a quote from Henry Thoreau, the, the old school author. And it's like, I'll paraphrase it, but it's wrong. It's like the, the, the mass of men are suffering from quiet desperation mm -hmm. or something like that. And it's um, someone, <laughs> someone can check that quote, Henry Thoreau's a very <laughs> famous author, but it's, uh, it's about quiet desperation. Yeah. Um, not reaching out, but actually desperate for a lifeline and not knowing where it is or knowing where it is, but being just afraid to, to reach out. And I'll say this to the guys, check on your brothers too. Check on your friends. If someone doesn't seem like they're themselves lately, whatever it is, if you think something may be off, just like, hey, man, how are you doing? Give them that platform to share. It could change something, right? Well, it can save lives. And if nothing, like, it also creates that window for the addictions. Like, it can lead to addictions. It creates that window for those type of escapism methods to slip in, right? And then be oh, yeah. it becomes a problem, then that becomes, then that they're ashamed to talk of or share or say, Hey, I think I might have a problem, Yeah, which I've used because I'm dealing with some mental health issues and it's just a vicious cycle. You just said it perfectly. It is a cycle. Um, you know, drink to numb painful feelings. 
um, come out of it, uh, feelings are still there, the drink again. And the feelings could be, you know, guilt and shame is, is huge. Uh, as we said, uh, loneliness, low self-worth, lack of meaning is a big one. You know, maybe you took on a career that you uh, didn't really love, but you did it for whatever reason. And now you're there. Now you're 50. You've got a mortgage, a car, your your wife leaves you or the marriage falls apart or something. And now you're, you're solo and you're under the crushing debt. And it's just like, it's easy to look around and go like, what is the meaning of this all? Um, what am I supposed to be here? People lose sight of what they love to do. And this is what in recovery coaching, it's not just about like, oh, stop drinking over and over and over. It's not like that at all. It's about, you know, I, I say this all the time. Recovery is about building a life that you don't have a burning desire to escape from. So what do you need to do? Okay, so you found yourself in this place with a divorce with um, uh, maybe a mild to severe substance use problem. Could be anything, could be smoking weed, too much weed, right? Like, um, you know, I'm all for, you know, smoking weed, go ahead, whatever. But if you're doing it every day, all day, and it's to numb something, there's probably a problem there. But, um, you know, you have this, you look around and you just have this lack of meaning, a purpose of just like, I'm not doing what I want to do. And then re recovery coaching helps you rediscover that. It's like, what actually, what the fuck do you want to do? And why aren't you not going for it? And now let's, once you come up with a vision, like, who do you want to be in this world? Like, listen, here you are, you've ended up in this situation. It's not a situation to your liking. Um, maybe you've got a lot of uh, anchors you're dragging around addiction or whatever, but who do you want to be? Because it's never too late. Um, the Another saying that I that I love that I say all the time is, you know, what is the best time to plant a tree? Well, it was 10 years ago. Yeah. But what's the second best time is right now. <laughs> so you've heard that too. Yeah. So that's so, you know, just because you're of a certain age doesn't mean it's over. Like there's so much joy in life and finding pursuing something that's meaningful to you and finding another relationship. If you're heartbroken, um, and you can't get over somebody, somebody else is out there that will make you happy too. If you are stuck in the past and staying in the past and, you know, it's going to be really hard to move forward, but there's so much more out there that you don't even know yet. People you haven't met, um, you know, relationships you're yet to have. If, if you want them, they're out there. If you stay inside drinking because you're lonely and not uh, isolating, which is huge, not going out, you know, by the time guys get to a certain age, they have very little friends left. They are all have drifted apart or gotten married. Or if you're the only one in your friend group that is divorced or going through something and everybody else is like, oh, I'm going away for the weekend and I got to take the kids to hockey practice and you find yourself by your, like there's the only guy looking around, that's a tough place to be. But you can create um whatever you want like it's it's not a sentence it's not a sentence that this is the way life is now you can take and charge you're the as i say you're the captain of your ship right i like that mm -hmm. maybe drop that shovel and <laughs> exactly quit digging the hole. you got yourself in it you can get yourself out of it i want to wrap this up zan with that quote that you just said or whether it's your own quote about mm -hmm. creating a life you don't want to escape from is that what was that yeah i say it as a burning burning desire to escape from so what does that give us that one again that that's amazing yeah just that's what um recovery should be is uh you know creating that life that you don't want to constantly escape from which is what uh, you know addiction is 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 an escape it's a numbing right you know it's yeah i talk about it, to sum it up, you know, I changed my entire life when I found recovery. And I will say I had tried to stop drinking numerous times before this as well. Um, I would last a month, I would last 30 days, uh, you know, one time me and my ex wife made it 60 days. And then on the 60th day, we got so out of control, wasted that night that it's a miracle that I actually survived it. It was so bad. Um, so I had tried numerous times. Relapse is and, and struggles with finding recovery are part of most people's story. Relapse is not a failure. It's a learning experience, right? Like what went wrong, et cetera. So, so I changed my entire life when I found recovery um, in many positive ways. I, I got my fitness back because I was very unhealthy. I became an ultra marathon runner. I hit, I 
you know, I go to the gym four times a week. I do, so I started playing hockey again, like things that I used to love. Um, and so it, it, everything changed for me in recovery because that's because um, I wasn't miserable with it. So like, I, I always say this, you know, I've got water here. You know, this is anybody could just stop drinking. You could, if that was vodka, you could just put it down, but, and you could white knuckle it. And I was going to say this earlier too, about the, you know, when ha you have to make the decision yourself, some people can say, like your wife can say to you, like, Hey, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to, I'm going to leave. And you'll be like, okay, honey, absolutely. And maybe three, four weeks, but you still want it. And now you're miserable. And now you're like, ah, like going through the motions and frustrated and you're most likely going to go back to it because you're not happy with it, right? That you have to look at it as an opportunity to for a whole new life, which it truly, truly is. Um, a whole new life is just waiting for you on the other side of that fear that keeps you stuck there in the first place. And mm -hmm. you create that life and you, everybody has the ability to do that, right? So it's, is it is it easy? No, not always, but is it worth it? it Yes, always. And I like how you reinforce that those external instigators or incentives aren't long-term effective. It's got to mm -hmm. be from the inside when yeah. you reach that. Yeah, absolutely. It has to be, uh, you know, there has to be a shift in thinking, in acceptance, and, and a willingness to pursue it, or at least consider that it may be a, a, a healthy path forward for right, you. Right. Um, you know, the people, is, it's hard to think, if you have a substance abuse issue, it's hard to think of the future without it. It's, you know, how am I ever going to go to that wedding? How am I going to celebrate a birthday? How am I going to go to Vegas? How am I going to go camping? All of these things that we have that we associate with whatever we like, to, whether it's weed or, or alcohol or whatever, um, it's terrifying to think about a life without those things. But I can tell you that it's not only possible, it's fucking amazing. And it can be done. I, I've been to Vegas multiple times sober. I go to, I've been to bachelor parties. I've been to all of the things that I used to get blackout drunk at. And I still have an amazing time. I don't hide from the world just because I'm in recovery. I embrace it all. And I always say like, except for now I drive my drunk ass friends home at the end of the night. And yeah. <laughs> uh, I wake up wake up far before they do the next day fresh and ready to do something awesome as opposed to having one of those horrible three-day hangovers that were so prevalent. That's a good point to make because I think a lot of people are would be concerned that, well, the life I knew, the fun I had is something I'm going to have to give up entirely. Mm -hmm. But now you can enjoy it and remember it. <laughs> it's so much better for me and that's what keeps me from going back is i do not want to go back to that life i truly love my life now i love the people in it it's authentic uh it's not it's not fake or bravado or drunken charm or charisma or drunken confidence it's uh it's completely authentic and it's worth it and it's i'm healthy. very grateful very grateful it's healthy physically mentally relationship community everything spiritually about it yeah spiritually, spiritually even. Mm -hmm. amazing thank you for sharing your story Zan. and i look forward to having you back again because th this is just a huge huge topic to try and cover in one episode um, yeah i agree I'd, I'd be honored to come back um i love what you're doing i love the platform i'm a fan of your social media and i'm i, I think you're doing really important work around many things Right. I mean, around domestic abuse, divorce, life changes, and even touching on stories of recovery, et cetera. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be involved with that with you. Well, thank you, Zan. I think it's important because there's many things that can break down a relationship and break down a, a person, like right mm -hmm. from the individual. So if if, if you're in a, a place that doesn't feel safe inside, you're mm -hmm. not even accepting and loving yourself. How are you going to be part of a relationship and a family as even as a single parent? So, you know, men can use some encouragement and understanding. So I, I'm i laughing because I literally just said that to a guy uh, yesterday, I believe about, you know, if, if you can't love yourself, how do you, how do you expect to give love right? and receive love? If you're, if you're, if you're struggling with self-love or self-worth, right? So, Amazing. Uh, great point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I hope you found that conversation insightful, encouraging, and also a reminder to all of us that 
What we see isn't always as it appears. People are going through a lot of things in their lives and we would want that compassion shared to us and that is something that we can offer to others without judgment. Instead, be curious and, and reach out, reach in, figure out a way that you can make someone's day a little better and it might just start with a smile. I thank you very much for spending your time with me here today and I encourage you to please subscribe to the fall podcast follow us on social media check out our events we have lots of ways that we can help you or someone that you love share this with a friend if there's someone that you know could benefit from this and hey keep smiling that beautiful smile because the world really does need your sunshine it means a lot that you spend this time with us and meet our experts and professionals who can help you through whatever life changes you're facing please refer to our terms of service available on our website lifechangesmag.com. The link is in the show notes. Our disclaimer, Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine and Channel and Divorce Resource Groups are intended to educate and provide quality, credible resource information. The contents should not be used as factual until consultation with the appropriate professionals for any guidance. Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine, and Life Changes Channel, as well as the Divorce Resource Groups, do not constitute endorsements for, nor liability for any claims made in the presenting of this information.